This question is for you, Mr. Buffett, and Mr. Munger. Mr. Buffett, I've followed your career since I first read about you in the first edition of the Forbes 400 that came out in 82. Reading your profile also led me to Ben Graham's book, The Intelligent Investor. Since that time, I've followed the careers of, I have also followed the careers of other successful investors, such as Walter Schloss, Bill Ruane, Richard Rainwater, Robert Bass, and Edward Lampert. In following your career and the careers of these other highly successful investors, it's my observation and my firm belief that despite their obvious high level of intelligence and some of them having gone to some of the best schools in the country, none of these people, including yourself, were born great investors. Every one of these, including yourself, learned to be a great investor. Graham learned from his experience. You, Bill Ruane, Walter Slosh, learned from Graham. Richard Rainwater learned from you, Phil Fisher, and Charlie Allen, and from reading Graham. Robert Bass and Ed Lampert learned from Richard Rainwater, and most likely from reading Graham and Fisher as well. These observations lead me to the conclusion that despite intellectual brilliance, although that probably helps, I've come to the conclusion that great investors are made, not born. Do you and Mr. Munger agree with this conclusion? If so, why? If not, why not? And if you do agree, what things would you recommend that someone do if they wanted to become a great investor? Also, what mental attributes do you think a person should have if they want to try to become a great investor? Thank you very much. Yeah, I largely agree with what you said. It, it, uh, I would say that there, I don't know to what extent uh, an ability to detach yourself from the crowd, for example. I don't know to what extent that's innate or to what extent that's learned, but that's a quality you need. I, w I would agree totally with you that a, a, great, a great IQ is not needed. I mean, you do not have to be terrifically smart to do well as an investor at all. Uh, I would say you're 100% right that I learned from Graham first in a very, very big way, and I learned something additionally from Phil Fisher, and I learned a lot from, from Charlie. And the proof is in my record, actually. From 11 to 19, I was reading Garfield Drew and Edwards and McGee and all kinds of, I mean, I read every book, Gerald M. Loeb, I mean, I read every book there was on investments, and I didn't do well at all. And I had no real investment philosophy. I had a lot of things I tried. I was having a lot of fun, and I wasn't making any money. And I read Ben's book in 1940, nine or 50, 49 when I was at University of Nebraska and and that actually just changed my whole view of investing it and really that basically told me to think about a stock as a part of a business now that seems so obvious you can say you know that that why should you regard that as a as, as, as the Rosetta Stone but it is a Rosetta Stone in a sense it, it uh, once you crank into your mental apparatus that you're not looking at things that wiggle up and down on charts or that people send you little missives on, you know, saying buy this because it's going up next week or it's going to split or the dividend's going to get increased or whatever. But instead you're buying a business that you've now set a foundation for going on and thinking rationally about investing. And uh, there's no reason why you need a high IQ to do that. Uh, there's no reason why you have to be born in some way. I, I do think there's certain manners of temperament that may be innate, and they may be learned, they may be intensified by experience as you go on, the partially innate, but then reinforced in various ways by your experience as you go through life. But that's enormously important. I mean, you have to be realistic. You have to just define your, your circle of competence accurately. You have to know what you don't know and not get enticed by it. You, you can't, you can't be, you have to have an interest in money, I think, or you won't be good at investing. But I think if you're very greedy, it'll be a disaster because it, it, that will overcome rationality. Uh, but I think, I think the same books I read uh, and really molded what I, how I thought about businesses and investing, I think that they're just as valid now. I mean, I haven't seen anything in the last... 25 years, and I read, I, I, I glance through most of the books anyway. I've, I've seen nothing to improve on Graham and Fisher in terms of the basic approach 
of, of going about investing, which is to, is to think about stocks as businesses and then think about what makes a good business. And really that's all there is to, to investing and, and, and having a margin of safety, which Ben talks about and so on. It's, it's not a complicated process, but it, it, it definitely requires uh, discipline. It, requ it, requ it requires insulating yourself from popular opinion. You just, you simply cannot, you can't pay any attention to it. It just doesn't mean anything. So you can't, the idea of listening to lots of people tell you things and all, that, it's just a waste of time. And, and, you know, you'd, you'd be better off just sitting and thinking a little bit. I mean, there were, there were no analyst reports on custom frame uh, makers, you know. It just doesn't, uh, and, and they wouldn't have been any good anyway. You just have to, you have to think. But you have to think about them as, in terms of their business characteristics and what they can earn on the on the on capital employed and that sort of thing. Uh, I would just read the, you know, I would I would read the Graham and the Phil Fisher books and 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 then read lots of annual reports. Think about businesses and try and think about which businesses you understand and which you don't understand. And you don't have to understand them all. Just forget about the ones that you don't understand. Charlie. Yeah, at a deeper level of generality. If you have a passionate interest in in knowing why things are happening, you always are trying to figure out the world in terms of why is this happening or why is this not happening. Uh, that cast of mind kept over long periods uh, gradually improves your ability to, to cope with reality. Uh, and if you don't have that cast of mind, I think you're, uh, you're destined probably for failure, even if you've got a pretty high IQ. Yeah, I would say we've seen relatively little correlation between investment results and IQ. I mean, that, not, not that there are a whole bunch of people out there with 80 IQs that are knocking, you know, the cover off the ball, but, but there are all kinds of people with high IQs that get no place. And yet, it's, it's probably, in a sense, it's more interesting to look at why people with high IQs don't succeed and then sort of cast out those factors and see if you can cast them out in yourself uh, and leave a residual that will work. Because if you, you know, it's like Charlie always says, you know, all I want to know is where I'm going to die, so I'll never go there. So um, <laughs> if you study the people who die financially, you know, with high IQs and say, why do they die? You know, uh, you'll see certain overwhelming characteristics that are present in, 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 these, in most of the cases. And you just got to make sure that either you don't possess them or if you do possess them, that you can get rid of them or control them in some manner. 